Hi, I'm David Spiegel. I'm a medical oncologist in Nashville, Tennessee. I work at Tennessee Oncology and I run the Lung Cancer Research Program for Sarah Cannon Research Institute. Today we're going to talk about head and neck cancer from the perspective of a patient. Head and neck cancer, I think, has always been a difficult cancer for patients and families because it's been regarded as a, kind of like smoking associated lung cancer, a cancer that you only get if you're a male who's been a heavy smoker and drinker his whole life. And what's really been surprising is the, the change in the type of patients we're now seeing. Uh, so, now, so now it's not unusual to see young patients, uh, female patients, patients who have absolutely no history of smoking or drinking. And that's been, that's been kind of a sea change from uh, both the perspective of doctors uh, and, and doctors involved in research and from the, the perspective of a patient and their families, where I think there's a lot of stigma associated with this cancer, just like, just like in lung cancer. So to put it in some perspective, uh, there's probably about 35 to 40,000 people every year who are diagnosed with some form of cancer of the head and neck uh, tract. We, we tend to lump cancers of, of this region under this heading of head and neck cancer, but let me, let me tell you a little bit more specifically what that means. That can mean cancer really anywhere from the nose, the nasopharynx, down into the back of the throat, the tongue, the mouth, the lip. Uh, the palate, uh, and then down a bit further, uh, down towards the larynx, uh, in, involving the larynx. And so sometimes I think older terms for this are throat cancer. Uh, I think we all uh, probably know what that means, but somebody could have a cancer, say, of, of, the, of the nasopharynx, which is uh, the, the region really above your mouth and throat uh, that involves the back part of your nose, uh, um, and, st and still that would be called head and neck cancer. Most people who have a cancer of this region um, could have uh, any symptoms or signs that you might think uh, would be common for a tumor in this area. So it, it could be something like uh, a change in, um, in, in breathing or swallowing uh, because of an obstruction in your, your nasal uh, uh, passageway. It, it might be more serious, like uh, difficulty with, uh, with uh, swallowing food. Uh, you can't get food down because of a lesion down in your throat. It might be something subtle, like uh, coughing up blood at times, spitting up blood. Um, maybe something you're brushing your teeth or, or uh, eating food or, or uh, something where you notice on a, on a napkin or, or tissue paper there's a little blood streaked area. Um, sometimes you know, you might think that is just from a sore throat or a cold, but it could be, it could be an early sign of a, of, uh, of a malignancy. Obviously, m most people are going to have uh, a situation where it's not malignant uh, when, they, when they see blood streaked in, in sputum or in the, when they're, when they're uh, brushing their teeth. And then some people really won't have any symptoms. Uh, just one day, uh, you know, it can just kind of be something you noticed uh, where you're looking in the mirror in the shower and you noticed a swelling on the side of your neck. Um, and of course, that's hard, right? Because a lot of people have sore throats, they get infections, colds, uh, and it's normal for your lymph nodes and gland or glands to swell underneath your, uh, your uh, mouth here on your, on your throat. And, the important thing is not to get alarmed about that because it's more common that you'll just have a little infection, but certainly persistent swelling, what we call unilateral or one-sided swelling, is something that probably needs to be investigated by, uh, by your primary care physician. The actual cancer itself tends to be something called a squamous cancer. It's true that uh, smoking, chronic, uh, heavy drinking al of alcohol is our, our known risk factors. We know there are environmental, occupational exposures that can be associated with it. But the most um, kind of concerning and at the same time, I say this in a good way, most exciting area of research has been the discovery of an association with a virus. And, and that virus is human papillomavirus. I say that uh, is exciting in the sense that um, we know now that virus is also linked to other cancers. So we know it's linked with uh, anal cancers. We know it's linked with cervical cancers. And I think Many people are aware of uh, the excitement about vaccines now in development to uh, help uh, prevent uh, the development of cervical cancer in, in young, young women who, uh, who, um, who are sexually active where there's a chance that uh, they could get exposed to this vaccine, to, sorry, to this virus. So to know now that a lot of men and women who are developing head and neck cancers that 
we, we now call HPV related cancers might one day have a strategy similar to folks with cervical cancer of a preventative uh, measure with a vaccine is pretty exciting to me. And also it tells us more about the biology of why cancers develop. The other piece of good news is it turns out if you, if you separate folks who have head and neck cancers that are the more traditional ones associated with exposures to an environmental or alcohol or tobacco uh, carcinogen, the, the folks that have cancers that are HPV or vi virus related tend to do better. So that's, that's some good news is that if this turns out to be a vaccine related, sorry, a virus related cancer, patients actually have a better prognosis uh, and seem to do better with treatment than folks that don't have a virus related uh, malignancy. The standard treatment for head and neck cancer, whether it's uh, one that's virus associated or say tobacco associated, is, uh, can include many things. Traditionally, it's been surgery. So surgery uh, has always been kind of the, the gold standard, the mainstay of, uh, of, of treating somebody with a cancer of the head and neck region for obvious reasons. You're trying to get rid of the cancer uh, in an area that is causing symptoms or signs of uh, obstruction, for example. And, and I should say surgeon means uh, an ear, nose, and throat ENT doctor that's trained in head and neck surgery. I, but actually treating cancer in terms of what are, what are very complicated, um, really modern operations, I think require that a patient be at a center or with, with a group of surgeons who are very skilled and know, what, and know how to do that. So they, they see a lot of it. And I think there are uh, ear, nose, and throat physicians in the community that, that do that, but you have to be... You want to be careful about making sure that this, this physician is, uh, has some experience there and is comfortable with managing those uh, really complicated operations. The, the other uh, way we treat folks with uh, head and neck cancer besides surgery uh, can include things like chemotherapy and radiation. In fact, the success rate with chemotherapy and radiation has been so high, now there's some questions about whether surgery plays a role. Um, and that's been such a nice story for the field of oncology. Uh, that, that using chemotherapy and radiation, which I know scares a lot of folks to hear those terms, actually can lead to as good uh, of an outcome for, for many patients and often without some of the disfigurement that comes with surgery. So that's been a real, real nice story in the treatment of head and neck cancer. And many patients can be cured with head and neck cancer, whether we're talking about surgery or surgery and chemotherapy and radiation or chemotherapy and radiation. But going into it, even for patients with kind of what we call locally advanced cancers, folks can be cured, and I think, I think that's uh, been such a nice, a nice story as uh, our treatments have gotten better.